boy. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Sharks lose their ninth straight at home. On Pride Night, it was a tough one to take. Online, in the organization, and all around. We'll break this one down. Hey, we'll talk about a a win in the Sharks organization. And more. Boy, howdy, a lot more right now here on Teal Town After Dark. Good evening, everyone. It is Saturday night, March 18th, 2023. The San Jose Sharks lose to the New York Islanders 4-1, to and we welcome you to this edition of Teal Town After Dark. This is your live interactive Sharks post game. We do this after every single game. So, if you want to be part of the show, here's how you do it. Chat with us and fellow hockey fans all over the world and in Sharks territory on the YouTube page or the app. Of course, follow us on the social, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, SoundCloud, Reddit, Discord, TikTok, Find everything at tealtownusa.com. And if you want to support the pod, you can always do it via Venmo at tealtownusa. Or if you're in the YouTube chat right now, you can make a super chat donation as well. So with that, good evening to you, Mr. Mark Eisenberg. How are you, bud? I'm good. I'm doing all right. How are you? It's been a very interesting day in Sharks territory. <laughs> sure has. <laughs> um, you know, it's uh, it's tough to see. Um, you know, it, it's uh, I I don't know. <laughs> there, there's. Let's just hit it out of the head, Mark. Um, there's a reason why the team's slogan is Teal Together. There's a reason why they've done all these theme nights. Not just Pride, not just Military Appreciation Night or Los Tiburones or, or you know, Lunar New Year or, or what have you. It's about bringing a community together. Making sure that they know full well that everyone, no matter who you are, no matter what you do, no matter how you identify, we want you to be a Sharks fan. We want you to enjoy this game of hockey. We want you to do it like this. So it's crazy enough to uh, to see what had come about uh, earlier today. And, you know, the thing is, James Reimer has uh, the freedom to say what he says. In my opinion, that sucks. I don't blame him. In the regards of expressing himself, you can do that. You can do that in in this country, in his country, in Canada. I, I mean, you can do that. That's what it's great for. However... His little comment today was a little, I don't know, convoluted a little bit. Um, Mark, what, what do you what do you want to touch on this one really quick? Yeah, it's a tough topic. Um, I think the franchise did a real solid job at handling the unfortunate situation um uh, i've got many thoughts on it and i'm not going to dive too deep into it just because you know these are things that i tend to not speak too much about because it's just way too much like opinions everywhere on it but i'll say this like if i was in the nhl i'd be wearing that jersey if i'm part of a team even if for whatever you know beliefs I have, if I'm James Reimer, you're part of a family, you're part of a team, you singling yourself out to do that is not only against the team, but it's against your community that's supporting you. Like he is in his profession because of the people that support him. 
So I think the best way I'd sum everything up that I'm feeling from it is just a major disappointment. Um, like you said, he has the freedom to express himself how he wants to, and that's what he chose to do. Um, like in the end of the day, he's still the goalie of the sharks and I'm still going to cheer for him. Um, but you know, it's just disappointing. Like it, it's a Jersey and there's a message behind that Jersey that we welcome everyone. It's right. not hard to throw that on pregame and be part of a team and part of a family. And, um, yeah, I think it puts the franchise in a tough place. It puts his teammates in a tough place and it puts the community in a tough place. So it's just, it's, to me, it's like a selfish move. Um, but you know, it's, it is what it is. He made his choice and, um, you know, I think the franchise reacted in the positive way. So I guess Absolutely. I would also say on top of all that, I think I would challenge everyone to try and look at the positives as opposed to the negatives. You know, I think we constantly always want to make a story out of the one or the two or the three, which is really the vast minority of the situation. You know, it's like even the NHL, you look at it, was Reimer the second or third player, I think, who refused to wear it? Like, how many players are the NHL? Six, seven hundred? Like, that's a very small percentage. And in life, the reality of the situation is we're never going to get 100 percent, right? You're never going to get 100 yeah. percent. So I think what the story really should be is that, you know, we are embracing as a sport. We're trying to. A majority of the players are trying to majority of the fan bases and the communities and the franchise are trying to embrace everyone and invite everyone in via nights like this. So I would love it if like we tried to stop making him the story, let him be in the background, you know, let's celebrate the players who are supporting and the community. And I think the Sharks tried to do that tonight with big time taking over the account and like focusing on different aspects Big, no. I completely agree, Mark. Uh, well said. Uh, you know, the, and, and you hit it on the head with the Sharks' social media accounts, and I can only imagine their admins tonight uh, with the amount of stuff that they've been dealing with. Yeah. Uh, you know, so Sharks' social admins, heck, the Barracuda admins. I know Liz Child, you're in charge of that. I, I can only imagine what what all of you've dealt with uh, in the barrage of. The, of mentions and responses to it. Um, but you're right. You need to look at the positivity of this uh, and the sharks hosting, uh, a game with the San Francisco earthquakes, LGBTQ plus hockey team against members of their, uh, office staff, uh, earlier day, uh, earlier in the week, David Quinn coached the earthquakes in the sign of solidarity. Those jerseys, the infamous jerseys. Now, a beautiful job, uh, and my and unfortunately my mind is blanking on the name of the artist, and she has done a she done a phenomenal job incorporating a lot of the symbolism into uh, the, in into the design with the uh, with the uh, heart with the um, trans colored. Uh, shark with the hockey stick with the pride tape on it. Uh, I think the execution was uh, well, well done. The and, shoulder uh, patches were nice too. Oh yeah, the, yep. the the swimming through the water and it says "Love wins" in the original mm -hmm. sharks uh, content. The Fond, sharks, right? yeah. yeah, the sharks uh, Twitter just kind of going through as I'm trying to find the name of the artist went through a lot of info and facts about everything and the one that kind of hit me in the head is that there are a lot of people who identify as gay or lesbian or bisexual or trans or who you know throughout that uh category of ranges and again please forgive me if uh, if it's coming off right i'm doing my very best to make sure uh on that um because I believe in, in it, and it's an absolutely an important thing because of it. Um, but, uh, you know, Howie Chow, um, a queer artist, made that design. It's a fantastic design. Those jerseys, 
minus rhymers will be available uh, for auction. The guys, the other rest of the team wore it tonight, uh, and it do, does go to uh, a number of charities. Of course, you can also help out the Trevor Project, among others in that. Um, and then, of course, you know, shout out to uh, to the Over to Glass podcast, which is a um, is a queer podcast regarding the San Jose Sharks and the Sharks have very been very open uh about being inclusive in everything that they do um you know with their Teal for Change project and, and that's how they are now with Team Teal so we want to make sure we mention that outright uh because it is a big thing you know uh you know years ago when we when I created the tweet ups uh, of Sharks fans, it was to come together. It's to meet up, you know, meet people out of nowhere. Like Mark, you know, whether it's, um, you know, whether you're in New York, we have, I had friends in Florida who came out for the Marlowe night. You know, uh, I think we had Jeff, a longtime fan of the show. Jeff Adams come out to, uh, uh, from Alberta. It's about bringing everybody together. And that's the important part of this night and everything, no matter what you identify as. So uh, with that, we will take a hard turn right into this wonderful hockey game. <laughs> oh, boy. OK. Um, so things started off not so bad. Uh, Kevin LeBanc with a nice shot uh, with his 12th of the season. Uh, you know, getting on the score sheet a little bit more seems like he is. You know, trying to turn a tide, despite later in the game he he takes a dumb cross-checking penalty. <laughs> um, but then, of course, Peugeot gets the tying goal back for the Islanders after, and ties it up at 1-1 after one. Um, what did you think of the first offhand? I think it was it was okay. It was even um, for most of the play, considering the Sharks were shorthanded for a majority of that period, I felt like. Um, I think that Peugeot goal was kind of a little bit of a dagger that shifted the momentum, um, being that it was a shorthanded goal. Um, you know, teams tend to generate momentum off killing penalties, which I thought the Sharks did fairly early. I think they had, what was it, three or four penalties against them in just the first period. Uh, yeah. Um, so LeBanc's goal... Solid goal. I think he had a very LeBanc like game, had some good moments. Um, and <laughs> yeah. uh, the goal was nice. But, um, you know, he seems to be getting a little bit more trust from the coach. But I'm still looking in his times on the ice. Not great. He had 12 minutes of ice time today. So, you know, it, the first period I thought was OK. Um, but I think that Peugeot goal kind of set it up for the rest of the game after that. Yeah, and that made it 1-1 one, one after 1, but uh, we'll continue on, but we do have some breaking news. This is from Curtis Pashelka. Sorry, I can't provide more context right now, but William Eklund just walked out of David Quinn's office here with Mike Greer in the room, too. My guess is that he's... I mean, you can you can guesstimate as to what that conversation is. Uh, this is game number 8 for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Sharks do go on a three-game road trip uh, this coming week. Um, yeah, most likely he's headed back to the Barracuda. Now, does this mean that there's another call-up happening? Or is Feshnikov okay to come back? Well, it remains to be seen. Uh, you did have uh, Martin Kaut, um come up from the Barracuda to take, in, take place of Sveshnikov. <laughs> in this game. Um, so, uh, boy, uh, Eklund, you know, didn't get on the score sheet tonight, but he's definitely shown that he can play a decent game up here in the NHL, but, uh, it's about avoiding that, burning that contract. Yeah. I think that's slightly upsetting news, which I was kind of cautious about over the last few games. Um, I don't know. I, I think he's been dangerous when, especially on the power play. I've really liked his puck movement on the power play. I think he does very well with Carlson. 
um, moving the puck and finding open spaces. And I've liked, I feel like every game he's had at least a couple scoring chances. Um, I think he's been one of the better Sharks forwards. Um, and I just, look, I get there's a financial side of this game, but in some situations, I feel like you need to reward these young players who are performing at a certain level. And I just, I don't, I feel like last time we messed with him in this sense, it kind of did something to his confidence. I hope it doesn't have the same effect this time. Now, that being said, I think obviously he'll be a great addition to the Barracuda, who I hope are on a playoff chase yes. <laughs> and lead to a playoff run. But um, I would like to see him still more in San Jose. Well, with the Sharks. <laughs> Either way, he'll be in San Jose. <laughs> Either way, um, yeah. unless some crazy non-playoff trade is about to be announced. But, uh, <laughs> you know, we'll... we'll... We'll keep an update on that uh, as all the uh, insiders will will get to us. So something's coming on, uh, something's coming up, and it's most likely that Eklund is headed towards the Barracuda after this game, and it makes sense in there. Uh, John Swenson, PJ48, good to see you, my friend. LeBanks goal was cool, but that charging penalty looked like mm-hmm. his brain left his body for a few seconds. Uh, yeah, that's for sure. Uh, and for that matter, speaking of, of penalties, um, Mark, the one that happened, you know, it's like five minutes into the game. The one where Hurdle looks like he takes a, a shot to the head. Mm-hmm. You know, Johnson comes in and defends him after, you know, w- I think it was Romanoff that hit him. And somehow the Islanders get a power play out of it. I'm telling you this, you have to forgive me because I was actually watching tonight's game on the Islanders telecast. So I don't really know what the Sharks announcers were saying about it, but I feel like the Islanders announcers were very biased. Like they're like talking about how you need to keep your head up. And I'm like, (laughs) first of all, Hurdle's head, it's not like he was looking at his feet. Sure, it was slightly tilted down, but I really feel like Romanov actually pushed through with his arm and his elbow. Like I think that's what caused some of the main contact there. I was watching that play and I'm like, listen, I'm fine if you're going to say that maybe it was like coincidental that the elbow came, made some contact with the face, but the Sharks to get a penalty off of that, like that, I, I don't see the difference between that play and some of the other targeting hits that I've seen where it's contact to the head. Yeah. Like, mm. It, it, we've seen a couple of times where sharks got hit in the head this season, mm-hmm. and nothing transpired. Um, so, uh, this Justin, it is now official. David Quinn has said it to the press that William Eklund has been sent down to the Barracuda. Um, I, 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 and Jerry, I've kind of mentioning it myself. An interesting one here. Why send him down in front of the press so soon after the game? weird yeah yeah uh, very I don't really understand inter- that very interesting um i'm gonna get your name wrong so forgive me the the teetage i apologize for getting that incorrect i think vl may get some time vl's been lighting it up he just had a hat trick the other night um you know they've been looking for some grit uh, in their lineup, and uh, we will recap the Barracuda game. And boy, howdy, was there some grit in that game? Uh, yeah. So, uh, m- moving on to that nightmare thing that's called the second period for the Sharks. It was a nightmare at the beginning of the year. It's become a nightmare uh, again for the Sharks. They give up two goals in a matter of like three minutes. First, Paul Mary uh, with a tip that goes through. Uh, Kakinen's five hole, then Ryan Pollock gets a one timer that, you know, I don't think anybody's going to stop with that amount of traffic there was out there. Um, but that kind of changed the game, Mark. You know, yeah. those two goals made it 3 1 after 40. It's like, oh boy, same old sharks. Yeah. And the Islanders are a team that kind of thrives off of those like shifts in momentum. They play with intensity, they play with some speed, and they're physical. Um, I think. You saw that with some of their goals tonight with like tips in front, getting bodies in front of the net. I think two of the goals were tips. Um, but yeah, it, it, look, the Sharks, it's no secret at this point. In the second period, it's like the, if, if you're a betting man, the over under on goals against that number must be pretty bad. Because I'm sure Vegas knows all the secrets as to like what's going to happen there. But like 
every game, it's just yeah. like clockwork at this point. You know the Sharks have given up one or two goals in that second period, if not more. Yeah, it, it could have been worse, but it, it got really sloppy from the Sharks there. Uh, not not the least of which, you know, they uh, after 40 minutes, they, they take four penalty, you know, one, two, three, for five, five penalties, you know, Zetterland interference. Johnson had that double minor for roughing. LeBanc had that dumb cross check or boarding call. Carlson had an iffy tripping call, but it was a tripping call no matter what. Can I say that Zetterland penalty was god awful? Oh, like the, the call was god awful. I mean, what is he supposed to do on that play? I, I don't really understand. He's the puck's in the air, and because he's stronger than the person and they're going for the puck, he gets an interference call for that. Like, I, I don't know. That seemed to me like such a weak call. It's it's borderline vendetta for the Sharks ever since the whole uh, incident happened Quinn. with with Quinn and Dwyer. Yeah, it, it just seems like that, which is not not the greatest thing in the world. But the <laughs> ref community getting together. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> At least we haven't dealt with you know. Uh, uh, why 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 am I why am I blanking on names tonight? Uh, the most infamous referee ever. Not Alan McCauley, right? No, not Alan uh, McCauley. Um, Wes McCauley. That's it. Well, Wes McCauley, yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. But like like John Swenson saying, more penalties is better for San Jose in the final 12 games. Yeah. Yeah. Just agreed. Uh, uh, Jerry F. with the Super Chat donation, $5. Thank you for the great coverage as usual. And for AJ and Jerk, this is for you. Here you go. <laughs> ah, moving onward. Um Let's uh, take to the comment from Quinn on Eklund. That was a tough one, but the value of making the playoffs and potentially playing in a playoff series is huge for development. We really like what we saw with him. He's disappointed. Shocking, because it's like here he's, he scores two goals in the last three games, Mark, and it's like, what do I need to do to stay up? But yeah. this is more of a business thing than anything. Um but also the Barracuda are fighting for a playoff spot. So, yeah, and he goes down there and he's basically their best player. So, right. you know, it's it's a big boost for them. Um, I think on the positive side, I think his game looks more well rounded than it was his rookie season. The first time he was sent back to Sweden, yeah, um, we saw a lot of that same offensive flair. But I think overall, he's looked like an improved player. Um, so I, I, I'm a lot more confident about his development than I was coming into this season after what was somewhat of a down year um, in Sweden. So I think he's on the right path. And hopefully the AHL will, you know, turn into a long playoff run like they're planning. Yeah. <laughs> we shall see. I, yeah. And again, we'll get to the Barracuda in a little bit. Um, uh, <laughs> Felix. Puck guy with a beverage tonight. Shocking. Yes. It's called liquid death. Mountain water. <laughs> I look like I'm drinking a beer, folks. Come on now. You should know me better than that. Uh, all, all of our all of our beer uh, we give to AJ, pretty much. <laughs> uh, John Swenson in the super chat. I'll open her a Warsteiner. Hey, you do you, bud. Cheers, my friend. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, third period, uh, Zach Parisi, or is it Parise? Not sure what it is at this moment in time. Uh, with a uh, tip in goal, that pretty much seals the deal for the Islanders. And even Randy Hahn was kind of like, wow, this is great for the Islanders, but wow, is this boring? <laughs> 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 it's like, oh boy. It, it, it's. I mean, one win in their last 11 games. They're now one, I believe, one seven and two since they traded away Timo Meyer. Um, I, I mean, they're, they're not tanking, though, Mark. They're not tanking. No, they are not tanking. I will actually pull up a stat, though, that I found interesting that was mentioned on the Islanders broadcast, which I don't know if Randy got to on the Sharks broadcast, but the Sharks currently have six home wins this year. <laughs> the record all-time for least amount of home wins in a 
80 or more game season is seven, okay? This was the Penguins back in, I think it was 1982-83 or 83-84, whichever year it was in that time frame. And the prize they got for having such a crappy season was Mario Lemieux. <laughs> so maybe it's fate, but we also probably don't want to be breaking records. Um, so there's a few more home games left this year to maybe get two more wins, but I'm also kind of like, do I want those two wins right now? Right. Uh, now, I will say he didn't mention that one, but he did mention that the Sharks franchise record for the fewest home wins was in 92-93 for uh, that team at the Cow Palace. The infamous 71 loss season, mm. they only won eight home games. <laughs> and it's just like... Yeah, it's tough. Uh, that reward better be Connor Bedard. <laughs> yeah, right. If, yeah. Hey, if that's the reward, I'll take that season. But well, it, it, oh. and and that's kind of the thing here, Mark, is that we're we're getting through this season, hoping, you know, wishing for Bedard here, and it's. It almost seems like if they drop down two spots to wherever they finish, it's a it's a, a huge loss. Yeah. And, you know, I wasn't necessarily on Team Tank early on. Um, but uh, now that we're now that this you know they're not going to the playoffs, you just play, traded one of your best players in their prime to New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Um, you're hoping for something. You're hoping that with this pain, you get something in return. You know, uh, I I remember, you know, Mike Babcock when he took over Toronto, saying there will be pain. There'll be lots of pain and a lot of pain to do it. And, and um, and I'm like, okay, sure, that's fine. They get Austin Matthews out of that, as you mentioned. Pittsburgh gets Mario Lemieux. Um. They gotta get something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, definitely. And that's the th that's the only I think light at the end of this tunnel. That's what's keeping me, you know, somewhat positive in this season. Because the thing is, I knew it was going to be a rebuilding season as it was. So, what better way to end a rebuilding season? Strike gold. Like it. It is what it is. Like I try not to get my hopes too much up because we know the lottery <laughs> system, and you know, even the top team has what twenty five percent chance right. after everything is said and done for having the first pick. But yeah, you know, it, it, we're in a positive place to at least get a you know franchise cornerstone or a player you build around. So yeah, but uh, I did find that stat very interesting, though. I was um, you know maybe like this is one of those fate things. You know maybe we'll break the Penguins record and maybe we'll get <laughs> our Mario Lemieux. Who knows? <laughs> right. Right. Uh, John Swanson. Uh, get Eric Gundas. Oh wait, yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> Uh, Puck guy, do you have any stories from that year? Yeah, it sucked. <laughs> I I will say, uh, when they played on my birthday, which is Boxing Day, uh, they did play the LA Kings and they absolutely destroyed them seven to two. So, you know, trust me when I said that was pretty epic that night. So, uh, so we'll see. Uh, Marty T, don't you dare. Don't you dare put that in the universe, dang it. Don't you dare. Shark skip it, dart. He refuses to play in San Jose, just shark things. Yeah. Don't you dare say that. Well, then the sharks better get a haul out of that. So, uh, Sharks do have the second best odds at the moment. They're at 13.5%. Uh, did Chicago lose tonight? It looks like they did. Yeah. They lost to those. To the Coyotes. Which those... puts the Coyotes far out of reach for the Sharks, which is crazy because just like three weeks ago, we were like separated by, what, two, three points? Yeah, absolutely. They have been on a tear. Yeah. Impressive turnaround for them, which is really kind of screwing themselves over. <laughs> but, yeah. And, yeah. And, and like I mentioned on the last show, it's like the Sharks had the most losses and the fewest points in 92-93, uh, but a team that had... Just 10 wins, 70 losses, four ties. Actually got the number one overall pick. The Sharks are now the worst team in, uh, or has the fewest wins in the NHL at 19 wins, 
37 losses, 14 overtime shootout losses, and yet Columbus has two more wins, and they are still have a three-point advantage. So with that being said, go Ducks tomorrow. Go Blue Jackets tomorrow. I mean, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. and it's just those overtime losses, you know? Oh. I mean, sure, those could have half of them probably could have been wins, which would have been made this even a worse situation, but <laughs> yeah. couldn't they have just been regulation losses? Uh, it's tough. It's tough. Um, yeah. It's just, I'll, I'll ask you the same question I asked Ian on Thursday night. What do they get? What happens first? Eight home wins? 21 uh, overall wins? Or 40 regulation losses? Which happens first for you? Mm, I'm going 40 regulation losses, I think. Uh. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's three more losses. Two wins, we get them to 21, and two wins at home. Those, yeah, I'm going th- I'm going 40 losses. <laughs> right? Um, yeah, just, uh, gosh. It's rough, but granted, it hasn't been one of the roughest seasons in Sharks history. Uh, for the Islanders, uh, they continue their, their crazy run. I think they're, uh, what do I have on my notes here? Uh, they're... Now 13-5-3 and three in their last 21 games. Uh, they're now three points ahead of Florida for the fi- for the final wild card spot in the East. Have fun playing the Boston Bruins. Mm. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, the, the Penguins did lose today, so they actually jump up ahead of them. Oh, wow. So the Islanders, well, the Penguins <laughs> have two games in hand, but the Islanders are two points ahead of the Penguins, so the Islanders are now technically in the first wild card, but the Penguins have the better winning point percentage or whatever it is. So if the Penguins... You know, the Penguins technically can still pass them again. Oh, you are um, correct. My my yeah. apologies on that. So, yeah, Pittsburgh er, gets leapfrogged by the Islanders. They're at 80. This is crazy. Yeah, just the East this... is a gauntlet. It's just you look at those teams and, like, I don't know. Whoever comes out of that conference into the final, I feel like they're going to be so beaten up that whoever they face against the West, if it's like Colorado, for example, mm-hmm. I just feel like the East team is going to be so – worn down from long series against really good teams that it could end up being like a really beneficial situation for the West. Yeah. And, uh, uh, it's like you can pick a conference and I would be picking West to win the Stanley cup because I devil's Rangers is always a a hard fought series. Toronto, Tampa Bay is going to be a rematch. Boston, basically getting right now Pittsburgh I mean I'm not going to count out Sidney Crosby uh, but the Bruins have been pretty damn good Mm. and Carolina and the Islanders ah, I I can't see an upset there right now so we'll see on that yeah the West seems more exciting and and I'm, I'm really hoping Seattle can get on a run even though they lost today to Edmonton um, so we'll see on there. Uh, getting back to the Sharks, though, uh, what do you think? How have you liked the new guys, Zetterland and Johnson? Getting a couple people asking about them on here. Um, it's tough. So I, I'm really gonna hold my judgment. I think until next season, because I, I don't think it's as simple as some people think to jump into a new team. I mean. It, there's the professional side of it and there's then the off side off ice side of it. So I'm not going to judge them too harshly. I would judge them very favorably if they looked really good, but if they're not looking good, which is kind of where I feel they are, I'm not going to judge them, judge them too harshly until they've had like a training camp and they've got time to gel with the new teammates and figure out the system, the coaches and everything. Um, but Zetterland has kind of been somewhat disappointing to me. Like I think he, shows some of the skills that I'd want in a player. I think he plays hard, but I just haven't seen some of the upside that Devils fans were talking about when that trade happened. Like Devils fans seemed pretty upset that they were losing him and they're like talking about how he had time on the first line and he can jump into any line, but I really haven't seen that side from him yet. So I'm looking for more from him next year. I'll judge him then. For now, I'm just kind of trying to watch him game to game to see what he brings, which hasn't really been fantastic so far. Hasn't been overwhelmingly excited. Now, granted, 
to replace Timo Meyer is one thing, of mm. course. So it'd be uh, tough to have expectations be that high for sure. Yeah. Um, but the ones that we do have expectations high also played in San Jose tonight. Ooh, Barracuda. Your San Jose Barracuda were at home tonight against the Texas Stars for back-to-back for their Pride Night as well. Uh, and this one was pretty crazy, Mark. Uh, going back and forth, a lot of a lot of the prospects, you know, that weren't named Eklund and Bordalo getting in on the scoring on this one. You saw uh, guys like Ko getting off a 22-game Schneid, Gushin. Uh, with his 16th. Robbins gets his 12th. And then you see the new guy, uh, Jacob Peterson, another part of the trade, get a goal and two assists. Uh, and, and a crazy uh, brawl at the end of second. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it was a, a special game to watch. I didn't get the opportunity to see it, but I definitely noticed Gushin recently. He's been on a bit of a tear. Um, he's got seven, eight points in his last four games, three games in a row with goals. Um, I don't know if he's necessarily quite NHL ready yet, but what do we have to lose? I wouldn't mind seeing him in a game or two. You know, he's got yeah. a lot of talent and upside, so reward him for how he's been playing. Give him a game or two. It doesn't really change anything down the line, right? Right. Uh, I mean, but I mean, I know there's certain limitations as to how many call-ups you get. The question is, do you want to call up anybody right now? Because, yeah. yes, Count is up. Do you want to bring Bordalo up now that, you know, Eklund's going back down? Um, you know, it, it, the Kuda win on a Seeloff overtime goal. Dell, you know, played pretty decently tonight with, uh, I believe it was like 30 saves on hand. He also had an assist on one of the goals tonight. So, uh, and wanted to fight. He could he could have had two thirds of a Gordy Howe hat trick for that matter. <laughs> Uh, the Cuda win 5-4 in overtime. That gets him to 57 points. And considering how this crazy 10-team AHL Pacific Division works, uh, the top seven teams get into the playoffs. Calgary getting the number one seed has a bye. But uh, the Barracuda with 57 points, one of the worst teams in the league, are currently holding down the seventh and final spot in the Pacific Division. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, and you think if you send Eklund down, well, what, they are sending Eklund down, so you send him down, and if Makamadulin is now coming over and he's going to be playing, those are both pretty good adds to the team that already, I think, has a decent amount of talent. And as the Sharks have kind of shown over the past year and a half, like they are prioritizing the success of the Barracuda. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that'll be something that could be exciting to watch down the stretch run here. And there will be reevaluating Ohotiuk uh, this yep. week, who's been out since February 11th with an injury. So it'll be interesting to see what happens now if the Barracuda, you know, get some reinforcements in uh, and make a run with it. Uh, the Cooter at 57 points, Bakersfield's number six at 62. Um, at the moment, the Barracuda would take on the Coachella Valley Firebirds. Oh lordy, great! In the first, in the uh, in the best of three playing game, and uh, oh, the joy! <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, hey, you make the playoffs, but mm, yeah, you get Coachella Valley. You have to play mm. the team that's forty and eleven. <laughs> right, that's great. I, you avoid the team formerly known as the Stockton Heat at. 43 15 and 3 of course that would be your next point if you were to somehow upset them uh on that one so uh but big win for the cuda in overtime yeah it is overtime but hey you take it any way possible tucson you know does have a game in hand on san jose so it'll be interesting to see how that takes place but uh their next game is Tuesday. They have a back-to-back in uh, Loveland, Colorado, to take on the Colorado Eagles. So that's Tuesday and Wednesday night. 
Uh, looks like 6.05 local time here. So I'll be on the lookout for that. The next home game, March 25th, next Saturday at 6 as they take on the uh, Bakersfield Condors. So uh, did they – I'm looking at uh, – I'm uh, well, let me see. Did I say all that for nothing because Tucson just won? I, I guess the AHL.com hasn't updated their standings yet. Great. Yeah, I show 56 at the moment. Uh, Mike yeah, it looks like are... Tucson won 3-2. to two. Okay, so at the moment, Tucson now leapfrogs the Barracuda. They're at 58. The, the Roadrunners are at 57. They now have the same games planned. So they're going back and forth, folks. It's going to be an interesting one down the road. So be on the lookout for that later this week with the Cuda and the uh, Eagles as they fight for that last playoff spot in the Pacific Division. So be on the lookout for that. But yeah, a uh, couple of comments in there. The Tietch, uh, Gush has really picked up his the forward transition player. He's main transition on power play, very smooth skating puck, and that shot. And who is that about? Gushin. Oh, Gushin, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, those are the skills that he's shown throughout the time I've been following him. I mean, he his offensive upside, I think, is fairly uh, high. <laughs> <laughs> he definitely has that. It's a matter of rounding at his game and also competing against stronger, better, and faster players. Um, so I, I think this is a good first year for him in the AHL. Mm -hmm. um, I was very interested to see how he was going to translate to a pro game. Um, so I'm more optimistic about an NHL future from him. Yeah, I, I really liked his play in the preseason. Uh, yeah. He had uh, almost had that, or I think he had that hat trick against Vegas in the last preseason game before they went over to, to Europe, indeed. Uh, Ruben mentioning, and good evening to you, Ruben. Uh, it doesn't make sense to call it Bordalo if he's needed for a playoff push besides a uh, push alongside Eklund. So I, I'll throw this at you. We met, kind of mentioned VL. Easy for me to say. Jeffrey VL, who's been on a good tear lately. If you're the Sharks, who do you bring up? If you're not gonna, if you're gonna leave Bordalo and Eklund down, who are you gonna bring up? Yeah, that's the that's that's the tough question because it's a matter of what do you think is if you're prioritizing the Barracuda by sending them. Eklund. I mean, obviously, again, that's the financial side of that. But if you're going to do that, then your moves have to also be in interests of the Barracuda. So you don't want to pull up a player who's been a key piece of recent performances, right? Like VL has been scoring a decent amount recently, and he provides a different element to that team. We'll see. And it could be positional wise. I mean, VL would be a quick spot to put on the fourth line, you know, with Lawrence, who knows? It, it could be interesting to see what's going to happen there. So be on the lookout. You know, Cout's already up here. We'll we'll see what happens down the road. So, well, it has been an incredibly interesting evening. Uh, we appreciate each and every one of you uh, joining us and uh, sticking around with us and, uh, you know, we both need to go to bed, though. So, <laughs> in case you missed anything or you want to watch this again, check us out on tealtownusa.com or your favorite podcatcher, whether it's Apple or Google Podcasts, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, Odyssey, now also on Amazon Music. Uh, so, be on the lookout for this there. Of course, if you're on the YouTube channel, you know, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell to let you know when we do go on the air with anything and of course leave a comment down below if you didn't watch us live tell us what you thought of everything that happened tonight whether the sharks play stunk lebank with the goal but lebank with a dumb cross-checking penalty what you think of eklund going back down the barracuda for a playoff push and how that most likely means bordolo won't be coming up until the cuda are eliminated from postseason play um and for that matter, what did you think of the Pride Night uh, or and the jerseys? Or for James Reimer, by all means, go ahead and 
hit us up on the comment section down below. We will see on all of that. So, Mark, um, it's getting to your time. It is getting to your time. This is the time to shine for Mark here, folks. He is our prospect guy. He is our draft guy. Um, as we leave you tonight, you can follow him at Marky Mark SJS. Um, how excited are you for this draft, especially the first round? Um, I'm very excited. That day is circled on my calendar, as is the lottery day. Um, yes, I'm very excited, but I'm very nervous. But um, I do want to add in one thing on the prospect note. Uh, we had Shark v. Shark prospect tonight in the college ranks. It was the ECAC championship, and um, Colgate was playing against Harvard. So we had Alex Ooh. Young, draft pick from a few years ago, playing against newly acquired Henry Thrun. And um, both guys did very well. Colgate won their first championship in like 30 years. Um, and Alex Young scored a really nice goal, second goal of the game um, for the team. He got an assist. And then Henry Thrun actually scored a goal for Harvard. So both Sharks players did well in that game, showed up on the score sheet. And now both teams are going to the NCAA tournament. Harvard getting there because they were good throughout the year and Colgate getting the auto bid from winning the conference. Gotcha. So the men's NCAA tournament for the frozen four, that's going to be a fun one and nice to see some sharks in, in the play again as well. So be on the lookout for that again. He's at Marky Mark SJS. Uh, we, I am at puck 14 on the Twitter and the Instagram puck knowledges on the YouTube channel starting at 7 p.m. Pacific time on Sunday. Be on the lookout for that for that week that was in Sharks hockey. And boy, howdy, what a week that was where we saw absolutely nothing victorious-wise for the San Jose Sharks. Whether you're team tank or not, yay! Um, <laughs> uh, they'll, they'll also break down uh, the CUDA and obviously go further into... Uh, James Reimer tonight uh, as well. And as we leave you tonight, there's a reason why it's called Teal Together, folks. We're all one melting pot. We're all one family when we rock our teal. And yeah, the, the Sharks, it's been a rough year. But like we said, <laughs> it, it takes a rough year to... to get a dynamite player in the draft to start turning things around because you know we're not in a rebuild even better stay with us hang in there teal together as always no matter what somebody says or doesn't do and with that good night everyone keep it real keep it teal keep it real teal have a good one